area. I'm active in the uh, SAFE organization, specializing in writing about early baseball and also about the Black Sox scandal. Uh, but today I'm going to be talking about baseball in the Civil War era. It's an interesting topic. Baseball had just become the national pastime by 1861. Baseball was, in fact, first named the national pastime in 1856. And by 1861, it had surpassed cricket and other sports as the go-to sport for Americans. And baseball has been a part of American history. The game has always been present during times of crisis to bring Americans together. Baseball was played during the Civil War, as we'll see in a second. It was played during World War One, World War Two. It was played during the epidemic of 1918, Spanish flu epidemic. What we're experiencing right now is actually the first time, really, that we've had a significant stoppage of baseball in this country because of a national crisis. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, well. Hopefully this audience doesn't have to be told by General Wagner Douglas. He was a very distinguished Civil War general, but he did not invent baseball and in fact had nothing to do with baseball. His extensive writings um, never mentioned any connection with the game of baseball. And he's only reputed to be part of baseball because in 1908, the uh, National League decided to investigate the origins of baseball and was given a uh, prompt by a correspondent saying, yeah, your double A went back and summit baseball in 1839 in Cooperstown. They went in good faith with that and proclaimed that the beginnings of baseball. And it didn't come out until later that the correspondent really did not know what he was talking about. Strangely, it's not for that it is very distinguished Civil War service is not known not remember today. Next slide. Next slide, please. Next slide.
this is a uh, place that they sold Starting like the Franklin Mint place you see today. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. We're on the political cartoon slide, Bruce. Um, let's just go to the decorate. Let's just go straight to the political cartoon slide. I can hear you again. Okay. Yep. We're on that one. Okay. Base okay. Baseball in terms of spread to the popular culture as well. This is the famous cartoon of the 1860 presidential election. And it presumes, oh, where does that go? That the audience is all already quite familiar with the baseball terms. Uh, John Bell was on the left, lamenting that he had three strikes and he's out, while Abraham Lincoln on the right proclaims, Gentlemen, if you t should take any hand in another match at this game, remember you must have a good bat and strike a fair ball to make a clean score and a home run. Next slide. Where was baseball played by 1861? The New York game had spread through the nation, especially where New Yorkers had moved to. Slide. Hello, Kelly. Next slide. Yes, we're on it. Uh, baseball played in 1861. Yes, we were on that slide, uh, so it's it's back now. Okay. Um. Besides, all the cities had gone there. Uh, Brooklyn Excelsior's tour. If you want a specific town, we have them. Uh, where we have a first baseball game, I'm very active in the protoball database. One of the things we don't realize about baseball during the Civil War is it spread to the south of the United States. Yes, the next slide. Uh, and also the south. It is spread to the south. Several clubs in Baltimore, Louisville, St. Louis played the game. The Potomac and national teams were in D.C. There were 11 different clubs in New Orleans, Louisiana. In fact, there were more baseball clubs in New Orleans than there were in Chicago, Illinois at this time. And teams in Galveston, Houston, Georgia, Norfolk, basically every state in the country. Next slide to the beer slide. The connection between beer and baseball didn't start with the 1882 Beer and Whiskey League. And it didn't start with Anheuser-Busch Company and the St. Louis Cardinals. In fact, in St. Louis, St. Louis German and Irish baseball teams tried to get around the Catholic Church's banning of drinking beer on Sunday. What they did was schedule baseball games and on Sunday and had beer as a sideline. Essentially, um, these church leaders, for some reason, gave that a pass. So they allowed beer drinking as part of a baseball game attendance, but not otherwise. Next slide. There's strong evidence that Abraham Lincoln played baseball. Uh, there's a story goes that when he was informed of his nomination by the Republican Party in 1860, he was in fact playing a game of baseball in Springfield. When he went to the White House, he often watched baseball games played on the field which was just south of the White House at that time, the usual field for playing games. And he when he went to the soldier's home, which is just north of the city at the time, to relax, uh, he'd often play baseball with the boys of the neighborhood. And the picture shows him uh, running around in his coat there being plugged by one of the boys. Can you imagine a president of the United States doing that today? Next slide. The war starts. 
thousands of Northern Club members volunteered for service in the Union Army, while a few enlisted in the Confederate Army. A.G. Mills of Cincinnati, a future president of the National League, packed the bat and ball with his Army gear prior to reporting to duty. Ninety-one members of Brooklyn's famed Excelsior Club volunteered for the Union cause, and one member of the Brooklyn Excelsiors, the Southern-born A.T. Pearsall, went south and fought for the Confederacy. It is said that when his Brooklyn Excelsior Club found out he was fighting for the Confederacy, they voted to formally expel him from the club. Next slide. This slide shows uh, David Wheeler's homemade baseball. He took it with him. He served in the 27th Indiana Infantry, and uh, he brought it home after the war, and that baseball can now be seen at the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. I want to emphasize that there were no sporting goods stores back then. The bats and balls basically were all handmade by the players. Next slide. This is the only verified photo of a Civil War game. One of the first photographs, in fact, of baseball being played. This is Fort Pulaski in Georgia in 1862. Members of the 48th New York Volunteers, a largely Brooklyn, New York team, were stationed at Fort Pulaski at the time, and they played baseball on the grounds to pass the time. You can see the baseball game in the background there. And just as an odd sort of side note, if you visit Fort Pulaski and go inside, you look at the brick walls, which are covered with ivy, and you might think you're actually inside Rickley Field when you're viewing the fort. Next slide. This is one of the few known photos of a soldier's baseball team. Many times soldiers rode home to talk about baseball. Because remember, they were playing baseball as much or more than they were actually in combat. For example, Private Alphys Parker of the 10th Massachusetts wrote, The parade gun has been a busy place for a week or so past. Ball playing having become a mania in camp. Officers and men forget for a time the differences in rank and indulge in the invigorating sport with a schoolboy's ardor. Another soldier, George Huck Putnam, serving in Louisiana, he humorously wrote of a baseball game that was interrupted by an attack by the Confederates. Quote, suddenly there was a scattering of fire which three outfielders caught the brunt. The center fielder was hit and captured. The left and right fielders managed to get back to our lines. The attack was repelled without serious difficulty, but we had lost not only our center fielder, but the only baseball in Alexandria, Louisiana. Next slide. Baseball in prisons. Prisoner of war camps. You might not think of those as venues for baseball games, but they were. This is a well-known illustration of the Salisbury, North Carolina prison camp and the, prison, the Union Army prisoners playing there. It was done by a prisoner named Otto Botcher, who was a commercial artist. He managed to get the escape from the prison, get back north, and made this lithograph for himself. I've written an article on baseball in the Civil Wars, which is online for the Protoball database. And um, every prisoner of war camp during the Civil War that had enough space to base, play baseball, basically they played baseball. Next slide. Baseball was not stopped by the war. Organized baseball continued to be played in the North during the war, but not in the South because basically all the able-bodied men were called to serve. The National Association of Baseball Players cut short its 1861 season, and play certainly diminished, but it never completely stopped. Next slide. This slide charts uh, newspaper mentions of the word baseball from the years 1858 to 70. 
And you can see during the Civil War a great dip in the number of mentions of the game of baseball. However, it never completely disappeared. And what you're going to see is in the when the war ended in 1865, immediately the number of mentions of baseball, which I use as a proxy for the games of baseball and the clubs of baseball, skyrockets from about 1,000 to about 10,000 a year. I've also done research on baseball played by Civil War soldiers. I found at least 380 verified instances of Civil War soldiers playing baseball. About 87% of those instances are Northern or Union Army troops. Only about 13% Confederate. Uh, next slide. Uh, the next slide summarizes um, some things I put on a, created for a handout, which um, has been uh, digitalized and put on the Facebook page for this conference. I've done a research based on 10,000 reported games from 1858 to 70. I've written up the uh, conclusions for, which will hopefully at some point be published in the Baseball Research Journal of the Society of American Baseball Research. I try to give a statistical context to the game that you are trying to represent. The average time was about 2.7 hours. The average score depended on the year. 44 to 60 total runs per game depends on the year. It starts out high, it starts to decline as fielding gets better, then about 1864 with rule changes, among others, uh, first bounce out is not allowed anymore. The scoring goes up, and then it starts to decline again uh, through 1870. Uh, these statistics show that how rules and equipment changes change the scoring for these years. Next slide. This next slide illustrates um, the spread of baseball during this time, geographical spread. What I'd like to emphasize is that by 1873, every state in the nation had verified baseball games and baseball clubs. Baseball had spread to foreign countries, too. In fact, it got to Hawaii, which was then a foreign country, by the way, before it got to North Dakota. They were playing in Alaska as early as 1867. Canada had a thriving baseball. Uh, many baseball teams in the Ontario era. Scotland. American expatriates were playing the game in Scotland and in Germany. Next slide. The Civil War connection between um, the baseball of the time and Major League Baseball is very direct and distinct. At least 40 Civil War veterans played Major League Baseball, and probably as many as 80. Remember, a soldier who was age 21 in 1865 would have been well, about uh, 27 in 1871. That's about the prime age for a baseball player. And in fact, two presidents of the National League and future Hall of Famers were themselves Civil War veterans. Next slide. We had a presentation earlier on the 1869 Cincinnati Reds, the first openly professional baseball team, unemphasized openly professional. Um, the so-called amateur teams during the 1860s quite often hired one or more people to play baseball. They were sometimes given jobs in the local community in that, uh, but essentially the rules against amateurism were being flouted. Uh, those of you who follow uh, college football like I do know that the shenanigans in recruiting and uh, grades and everything that they pull for college football teams and basketball teams is the same that they did for uh, that amateur teams did for baseball in the 1860s. 
1869 Red Stockings made history not only as the first openly professional team, but they compiled the longest winning streak in baseball history. Their official record for 1869 was 57 and nothing. Their highest paid player at $1,400, and their superstar was George Wright, with 519 that year with 59 home runs. In 1870, they continued. They ran their unbeaten streak to 81 games before finally losing in New York City to the Brooklyn Atlantics. Um, the next year, Major League Base, the Major League Baseball starts. 1871, and 1870 really marks the end of the Civil War era of largely amateur baseball. Its demise was perhaps inevitable given the lure of money and the wish of teams to win ball games. Uh, next slide. And just to give you a perspective on what the salaries were in those days, the star shortstop, George Wright, earned $1,400 that year. Now, $1,400 was about three or four times what the average factory worker would make in a year. But think what Mike Trout is making, $36 million a year. I'm not sure he'd play for the 1870 wages. But you can see why the attractiveness of that kind of money would lure people away from uh, the amateur game. And it wasn't just the salaries that they got. They got endorsements, too. Here's a Cincinnati Red Cigar Box from 1869. This goes to show the product endorsement that you see today from sports figures. Nothing new with that during the Civil War era. Next slide. And with that, I'd like to conclude. I'd like to thank the uh, Vintage Baseball Association, Kelly, Kelly, all the presenters so far, and all you listeners. Uh, it's been a great program so far. And again, thank you for having me with you today. Um, I guess the time would be for questions now, but thank you. And at this point, it looks like we do not have anybody with a question at this time. Okay, I, can, uh, I would encourage uh, people who listen to this to visit the Protoball website. We have www.protoball.org. Uh, I contributed uh, almost 6,000 entries to it. It basically shows, tries to show the first instance of baseball in every town, county, and state in the world, in the nation, and in the world. We have 125 countries so far. We have um, every state, obviously, and every large or medium-sized city in every state. Bruce, if so I can again, jump if you're in. Looking for local uh, mm -hmm. Looks like we have a caller. Go, right caller, go ahead, please. Yeah. Yes, uh, uh, not, go ahead. Yes, yeah, it's not a uh, not a question. Just uh, one of the cool things that the Ohio Village Muffins were able to do back in 2014 was there was a documented game at Johnson Island, which was a Civil War a Confederate prison camp, and there was a game that was documented to, to be played. And we actually, with the uh, great black swamp frogs, were able to recreate uh, a game played up there almost exactly 150 years to the date of the original game uh, in 2014. And it was very cool as the site is being excavated and we were able to almost play on a field uh, that was almost exactly the field that they had played on. So. We had recreated a game on there. We were maybe 15, 15 to 20 feet for a week where, where they thought home plate was actually at. But um, what, a, what a cool experience to, to recreate that game uh, uh, based on the Civil War history of that, of that camp. So it was a pretty, pretty cool thing. Yeah, I was unfortunately unable to make it that weekend to attend. Uh, 
I've done extensive research on the players in that game. And many of them were from uh, the New Orleans baseball clubs from the pre-war that I talked about a little bit earlier in my talk. Um, one of the things was the Louisiana Brigade in Robert E. Lee's army had been largely captured in 1863. And many of them had been sent to Johnson's Island. And that's, that was the springboard for the prisoners playing baseball there. Suddenly they had this influx of uh, New Orleans players who had been very active for two years previous before the war playing baseball there. And they were the ones who sort of uh, put that put baseball over on Johnson's Island. Um, there were uh, several games played between the prison teams. And uh, for a while there, some people thought it was the first baseball played in northern Ohio. Uh, it's not quite Correct. true, but uh, it's an interesting footnote to uh, Civil War baseball. Good question. Yes. Hello? Yes? Yes. Um, my question is, Bruce, uh, Gary Ship Cassie, um, you said a lot, most of the games that were played during the Civil War were in the North. Uh, my guess is that most of the activity was along the East Coast and not in the Midwest. What did you find out? If you take a look at my article on Protoball, you'll see the statistics. The game was mostly played by Northerners, but at least half the time it was in their camps in the war zone. Oh, not in uh, not in their camps, their training camps up north. Um, for example, in 1863, the Army of the of uh, the Potomac, the Union Army of the Potomac, which was serving in Northern Virginia at the time, they were in a hiatus there for a month or two, and they were playing baseball almost every day. And one of the things I couldn't uh, give you was the fact that the Confederates were on the other side of the Rappahannock River, and they would come out and watch the Union soldiers play baseball on their side of the river. And they would play, clap and applaud for good plays and boo for bad plays and everything. Uh, it just shows the camaraderie that baseball, it, it engendered something that went the went beyond politics and went between the contesting soldiers. But yeah, the, the baseball wow. during the Civil War, most most of the reports we have are from Eastern teams and Northeastern okay. teams too. Okay, that, that I just, I, I kind of thought that was true, but I needed to hear it from you. So after the Civil War did, and you may have mentioned this, I just didn't catch it, did the game sprout uh, pretty much throughout the country? Where did it Where did it take off uh, for the most part after the war? Did it spread everywhere or t tend to be in the north because the south was still uh, dealing with reconstruction? Um, again, I'll refer to an article I wrote uh, a couple years ago for the um, publication Baseballs, how baseball spread before the war into the south. And there were a bunch of Confederate Army veterans who played baseball and a bunch of pre-war baseball players who played served in the confederate army it spread everywhere 1867 that's two years after the war it's in alaska for crying out loud uh, <laughs> hawaii was an independent country it, they were playing a, a predecessor game even before the civil war there wow well thank you thanks yeah, for Rick. answering my questions and thanks for your presentation today Oh, you're welcome. And Bruce, it looks like that uh, wraps everything up for us at this point um, with no more questions. And I know our next presenter is standing by. So thanks again. Okay. Let Eric on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, then there's Leslie Heafy. Uh, she's also a college uh, professor. And her topic, and I don't have, I have a better description of her topic. I'm looking at what I'm looking at here and it's not what I want. Um, she sent me an email, questioned me about what her topic should be about. And uh, initially it was just about American women in baseball. And I'm like, well, that's, that's not good enough. So I kind of gave her my experience with women's baseball and um, and her topic is women in baseball, the early years on the field and beyond. Players who played served in the Confederate Army. It spread everywhere. 1867, that's two years after the war, gets in a last of the Brian Outlaw. Uh, uh, Hawaii was an independent country. They were playing a uh, predecessor game even before the Civil War there. 
Eric, you can go ahead. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Eric Miklich calling from Long Island, the heart of the COVID attack. Today I'll be speaking about Joe Sprague, perhaps the best pitcher of the 1860s. Nobody knew. But before I do that, I have to explain what is commonly known as the best pitcher and his accomplishments, which is certainly everybody should know here, is Jim Crichton of the Brooklyn Excelsiors. Now, the Excelsior Club, prior to Crichton, had a record in 1858 of 8-5 and, and in 1859 of 12-3, and three, which was still a fantastic record. Once Crichton got there, their record almost stayed the same. The Excelsiors themselves did not take on the best competition, and that is part due to their catcher, Joe Leggett. He must have had some kind of a, a phobia about competition because if you look at the years I mentioned, 58 and 59, and I only mention those because that's when Crichton started and then he moved over to the Excelsiors in 1860. Their records are strong, as I said, in 1858, 8 and 5, due to their competition, which was just not competition at all. The only team that they played, which was a really the strongest team, was the Brooklyn Atlantics that year. They lost both games to them, and they lost the other three games to teams that have over 500 records. They did not beat a team with, that had an over 500 record. That year, after 58, they didn't play the Mutual Club, which was 11-1. They didn't play the Empire Club, which was 9-1-1, or the Expert Club, which was 6-1. The next year, in 59, they had a record of 12-3. and three. Again, this is without Jim Crichton. They lost the opening game. They went on to win seven in a row, and then they lost to a star club of Brooklyn. And the pitcher in that game was Jim Crichton, and that's probably the first case that Joe Leggett, who was the captain of the Brooklyn Excelsiors, got a taste of Crichton. I'm sure he knew about him and heard about him. Crichton was certainly the first person to bring speed and accuracy into the pitching of baseball. The following game, the Excelsiors beat the Eagles, the Eagle Club. Six, they were 6-3. and three. It was their first win over a club with an above 500 record in 22 matches dating back to September 28th of 57. So in almost two years, they had not beating the club with an over 500 record. That year in 59, they failed again to schedule any competition. They didn't play the experts who were 10 and 2 or the Atlantics who were 11 and 1. I guess they had enough of them. So Jim Crichton, he starts off with the Niagara of Brooklyn Club, pitches for them in 58. And during the 59 season, he moves to the Star Club. As I said earlier, he beat the Excelsiors, and then in 19, 1860, he turns up for the Excelsior Club. He's probably one of the first players to be paid to play baseball. It's impossible to say that he was the first. However, if you really study box scores from the early 50s and early, uh, sorry, the late 50s and early 1860s, you'll see players moved around much more than you would ever believe. And I am sure. Others were paid. He certainly was probably the first, one of the first, because he changed pitching due to his speed and accuracy. And 